A very good morning, everyone, and a warm, warm, warm welcome from a beautiful spring day in, in Cape Town. I hope the rest of the country is as, uh, as beautiful from a weather perspective. Uh, my name is Dwayne Marker, and I oversee the Sydney and Bellary Retirement Fund. Um, and today we have three fantastic uh, speakers lined up for you and three fantastic topics. Firstly, I'd like to welcome back Eva Madrova from Attendant Um Eva, nice to see you again. Welcome back. And I believe you are accepting uh, gifts, but you're just not declaring them. Uh, we've got Leanne from the VEC, who's going to be uh, talking to us about the two-part system, uh, the legal specialist and SIRF's independent legal advisor. And lastly, we've got Intercontinental. We've got Stephen Charlton from SCI, the world's world largest market manager. And he's going to give us some insight into the mass trust legislation. So over to uh, Eva, Leanne, and Stephen to introduce themselves before Eva will kick off the session reporting back on quarter three's investment performance. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Uh, for those of you that don't know me and have not listened to one of my webinars before, as Dwayne mentioned, my name is um, Eva and I look after investment consulting um, at Signia Asset Management. I'm also the appointed um, investment advisor to the Signia Umbrella Retirement Fund, and I hope to share some insights with you this morning on uh, you know, what we've seen in the markets, what performance has been like, and how we are positioned for this current um, and very volatile market environment. Um, I'll hand over to Leanne to introduce herself. Morning, everybody, and thank you to for having me again. Um, good morning to all the delegates. It's lovely to be able to speak to you again. And today I'm going to be discussing the two-pot system. Well, the two-pot system as we know it now, because things are changing fast. Um, and we'll also include in the discussion today the proposals that Treasury made to the Standing Committee on Finance. Uh, my name is Steve Charlton. I work for SCI. Um, I'm head of SCI's DC uh, business outside of the US and Canada, covering uh, in Europe and Asia. Um, I have uh, about 35 years uh, history in DC. Um, and the last uh, six of those have been with SEI and um, managing our master trust. And Dwayne was kind enough to invite me along just to talk about the legislation uh, that we've had to enjoy in the UK. Um, and I understand that a similar version is heading your way. Thanks, guys. And remember to post your quotes or your quote questions in the Q&A section of the chat box. And we will be discussing those questions after every segment. So over to you, Thank you very much, Dwayne. So I'll get straight into it as we do have a lot to cover this morning. As I said to you, what I plan to cover today is basically the quarter three in review. So please pop through any questions that you may have, be it on performance, be it on positioning, or uh, just our views in terms of the um, current market environment. And uh, just a reminder of you know, why we really have created this product, the Signia Umbrella Retirement Fund, is our mission is really to restore confidence in the retirement fund industry through creating an innovative product that can make it easy for our members to save, with the ultimate vision uh, to be able to enable life-changing and dignified retirement out outcomes for all of our members. In terms of markets and economics, what we're seeing in the market is that there's extreme pessimism. So this chart that I have in front of us right now shows us the percentage of US stocks that are above their 200 day moving average. And we can see that that's basically at an all time low, really showing us that the market is oversold. So people are feeling very pessimistic in the market and they're being quite risk averse is what we're seeing um, at the moment. And if we look at the numbers for um, July, August and September for the three months of the quarter, uh, you know, there really is no surprise as to why people are feeling so negative. July was not all that bad, as we can see on the slide. There were a lot of asset classes that returned positive. So the bars to the right hand side show us positive returns, whereas the bar to the left uh, shows us negative returns. So other than gold and China for the month of July, we did see a nice bounce, but this was really a bounce from June lows that we saw in July. Then in August, 
um, things kind of turn for the worse. And we see that specifically risk assets, we can see that um, equities, not just South African equities, but um, a lot of other you know, regions around the world, uh, pretty much risk assets were uh, not very loved in August. We can see that some of the themes that we like to follow, such as emerging markets, such as China, actually gave us very good returns um, in August. And then we can see in yellow, these are more your safe haven type of assets, the income generating assets. We can see that those did uh, protect in August, um, other than global bonds, which we're still avoiding in our portfolios. Um, and those gave us positive returns. And then came September, one of the worst months uh, that we have seen I mean, the market, specifically the worst one for the quarter. And we can see that pretty much everything is on the left-hand side, giving us negative returns. So overall, it really has been a tough quarter. The portfolios, depending on the risk profile that members are invested in, um, have a large allocation to um, risk assets. Quarterly numbers are never really good to focus on, as we know that ultimately our members are here to save for retirement, so they do have a very long-term time horizon, but we can see that it has been a tough time in the market. So we can see that, uh, you know, equities have been poorly. Our thematic satellites are also um, in the negative other than healthcare, which tends to be a sector that um, is defensive. And then some of the income asset classes that did well in September as well. So why has it been such a tough time? Well, we've seen a lot of inflation in the US. We've seen um, a very strong dollar, which has made uh, you know pretty much every other currency weaken against the greenback. Jerome Powell says yeah, that we can expect a growth recession. So meaning that uh, you know we'll see growth in employment, but a recession in retail spending as, as things get tougher and tougher. So um, next week we expected to see another 75 basis point um, rate hike, and it really is this roaring inflation in the US that has sent um, the market into turmoil. We do expect inflation to start subsiding and to experience a down wave of inflation over the next couple of months as we're starting to see this lag effect of all this tightening, so the hiking of interest rates. Um, that um, the Fed has been um, doing over the last couple of meetings. Then what has been very topical as well has, of course, been this war between Russia and Ukraine. And up until this point, you know, Putin had a lot of threats with regards to, uh, you know, the gas supplies. But Europe has been... Um, you know, slowly building up their storage capacities, um, and they're now less reliant on Russia uh, for the gas, and they've built up good storage uh, capacity for the winter ahead. So now he's turning to nuclear threats. Um, in terms of these storage capacities, what we can see on the left-hand side is, as I mentioned, the storage capacity of Europe um, is, you know, pretty much um, at full capacity, which is good news. And then if you look at the little chart on the right-hand side, they're also expected to have a much warmer winter which is good news, as of course, if they have a very cold uh, winter, then they're going to use a lot more, uh, you know, gas to, you know, heat, um, heat their homes, and um, then they may run into problems uh, where they have to, you know, switch off their electricity, which we're all very familiar with here in South Africa. And then China is very topical. We do invest in emerging markets. We do have China allocations. We are overweight um, this uh, region, so both China and emerging markets in our portfolios. And as much as it has been very volatile, um, the fundamentals for investing in China and emerging markets over the long term do remain. So it has been a volatile time, but you know there's certain numbers that are looking very positive, especially over the last quarter. For example, you know, truthfully, GDP in China did surprise to the upside. It was projected to be at about 3.3%, and we saw a figure of 3.9%. We also saw that industrial production growth is accelerated from 4.2% uh, to 6.3% year on year. But, um, you know, there are still, of course, challenges. Uh, for example, you know, this president might take his third term. Nobody likes, uh, you know, a nation that is growing in that way of, you know, almost a dictatorship. We did see over the quarter when uh, the U.S. Uh, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi visited Taiwan that that caused tensions as well. 
So investing in China and in emerging markets in general is for the long term. We never expect the volatility to stop. Uh, so you do expect it to be very volatile, but to provide good returns for us over the long term. And from a valuation perspective, China is um, you know, looking attractive. They're also quite different to what's happening in the rest of the globe. We're seeing um, tightening in terms of, uh, you know, policies all over the world, including uh, South Africa. So we're seeing um, high inflation and due to the high inflation, central banks around the globe are tightening and hiking interest rates. Whereas we're seeing the opposite um, in China. They're trying to you know, stimulate the economy and lowering um, interest rates. So we're seeing policy easing. Um, and that policy is, in, is due to the fact that retail sales and the property sector, retail sales alone in the property sector um, is kind of weakening. So we still, uh, you know, it's by no means our largest allocation, but relative to benchmark, uh, we overweight emerging markets um, in the portfolio, we underweight the US, and we still continue to hold that view as the fundamental for long-term investing um, in these regions still makes sense. This is where uh, the population of the middle class is growing, and it's really that middle class population that consumes and can provide healthy GDP growth um, going forward. And China is not all emerging markets, or should I say emerging market investing is not all about China. There's other nations that we invest in as well. And for example, uh, you know, one of the companies, Saudi Aramco, has actually reported the highest quarterly profit on record. And this is a company that is, uh, you know, one of the constituents of our Emerging Market 50 ETF and features, um, you know, in that Emerging Markets component uh, that we have on the offshore side. There's also other nations uh, such as, uh, you know, uh, Vietnam and Malaysia. These countries are net food exporters, so they have been more protected from the current uh, you know, market environments and more resilient uh, from an inflation perspective. So there are other emerging markets, not just China, although China is, of course, uh, you know, the focus as, you know, from a size perspective, uh, they do make, uh, you know, quite a sizable chunk of um, emerging markets investing. And then as much as, uh, you know, the global landscape, um, sets the tone for you know what markets do globally we cannot forget that the majority of the portfolio is invested in south africa and unfortunately in south africa um, it has uh, not been uh, great from a low trading perspective which of course affects growth um, it has been very tough for the consumer consumers are dealing with higher interest rates so spending uh, is a bit on the back foot and um, you know the rate hikes that we have seen um, are affecting um, growth so we've almost got that double whammy um, of uh, you, know, you know the less growth from an electricity perspective um, as well so in terms of equities, when you see our positioning a little bit later on, uh, we are underweight is the equities due to these headwinds that our country is facing. But on the bond side, you know, relative to everywhere else um, in the globe other than Brazil, uh, the South African bonds are really still providing some of the highest real yields in the world. So we overweight South African bonds, but underweight SA equity. So that is our current uh, positioning. And um, you know, this just really talks to uh, what I just mentioned about uh, the electricity supply. And um, we know that uh, you know, at the moment we're still experiencing no trading. I kind of went uh, to bed in the dark and woke up in the dark today. So it really uh, you know, needs to stabilize before we can restore some confidence in our economy. So before I get to performance, I'm not going to cover uh, the performance of every single portfolio that's available um, on the platform in detail, but really what I'll focus on is the portfolios that the bulk of our members um, are um, invested in, and those are the default investment portfolios. And just a reminder of what the default investment strategy of the Sydney Umbrella Retirement Fund is, it is a life stage model and management committees can choose one of three different life stage models. In addition to that default investment strategy being a life stage model, members can opt out and there's a number of member investment choice portfolios. 
there's no uh, limitation as to the frequency of switching between investment portfolios, no switching fees, and there's no specific time of the year um, that uh, members uh, will be required to um, switch um, you know, between the investment portfolios. So this can happen at any time. So members that are younger and have a long-term time horizon will have um, the highest allocation to equity. So those would be members invested in the 70 portfolios. The number in the name of the portfolios implies the approximate equity allocation. And as members move from six years to retirement, to five years before retirement, four years before retirement, as you get closer and closer, your normal retirement age, um, members will be invested in a more conservative portfolio, having less equities and more safer type of asset classes such as bonds and cash. And the three different life stage um, options that management committees can choose from um, are the skeleton, signature and synergy ranges. The passive option is the skeleton range, so that is the lowest cost option. The signature range is a mix between active and passive. And the active balance range is the synergy range, where it's totally active on the local side, and it's got the passive component on the offshore side. And in terms of how these portfolios are constructed, the skeleton and signature range follow the specialist approach, whereby the asset allocation is decided up front, and then um, the allocation to the various managers or strategies, whereas the balanced approach, we divide the fund uh, between a number of active managers, and then these active managers then decide on the split between bonds, equities, cash, et cetera. So it's a difference in a construction approach. And as I mentioned, members, depending on their ages, would follow a different uh, risk profile. The older a member is, the less risky the portfolio is. So if you look on the risk return spectrum, you'll see on the top right hand side, the higher risk portfolios are your 70 portfolios, as well as your single manager portfolios. But these are also the portfolios that are expected to give you the highest return. So there will be volatility along the way, especially when markets have been tough like we have seen this year, but they are expected to reward us for that, uh, for that risk taken over the long term. So now we get to performance. As I mentioned, I will be focusing on these default investment strategies. So if we look at September and three months, really the quarter and the month, it has been tough. So you see the minuses um, in September, never good to focus on short-term performance, especially in a retirement fund context. So looking at the longer term numbers, we can see that the portfolios have done very nicely um, against inflation, as well as against their own benchmark. What's quite uh, different and unusual uh, to see in a normal market environment is for your 70 portfolios to be worse than your 40 portfolios, for example. But in the current market environment, where risk assets have sold off and safer type of asset classes have protected, if you look at the one year numbers, we can see that the 40 funds have actually performed better than the 70 funds. But over the long term, uh, you know, we do expect. Uh, members to be rewarded for the risk taken. This chart always summarizes it quite nicely for me. It's important to not focus on September or on the quarter, even on the year 2022 that we've had. It's always good to sort of zoom out and think about the fact that we are investing for the long term and consider what the long term performance of these portfolios has been and what it's expected to then be um, going forward. And we can see what this chart shows us is how 100 Rand invested funds has grown um, over the last um, 10 years. So, what we can clearly see is that whether um, investment was in the signature, synergy, or skeleton range, we can clearly see that this 100 Rand has grown but it has not grown without volatility. You do see the ups and downs along the way because we are investing the bulk of the portfolios in risk assets, such as South African equities and global equities. We do expect a lot of volatility along the way, but um, members will be rewarded for taking on that risk over the long term. And then lastly on performance, before we get to the positioning, I do want to show you the performance of these uh, portfolios relative to our competitors. Um, and um, a good way to uh, compare these portfolios from a performance perspective is to look at the Alexander Forbes surveys. 
So what we have in front of us is the low equity market manager survey. So all of the portfolios in the survey are low equity in nature. So having roughly about 30% investing in equities. We can see that over the one year, Synergy has been the best performing um, with the signature a little bit lower down and the skeleton uh, further down to the bottom. Focusing on the longer term numbers, we can see that over the seven and 10 years, again, Synergy over seven years um, has been one of the best performing portfolios. And over 10 years, um, the Signature 40 Fund has outperformed um, every other similar portfolio in its category. Then the medium equity portfolio, we can see that uh, these are the portfolios that have roughly 50% of um, the allocation to equities. And we can see that again, synergy, so active management has really uh, worked over the last year. We do believe in the blend between active and passive, but due to the volatile nature of markets um, over the last year in specific, active management has been good for uh, you know, managers that have been able to rotate in and out of certain opportunities. So we can see Synergy being more active in nature has done really, really well over the one year, giving us 3.2%. Uh, the Signature 50 fund a little bit lower down and passive investing. Um, it has been more tough for uh, you know, passive funds and um, the return has been 1.7 over the last year. Focusing on the longer term, we can see that over the 10 years, it really has been that blend of active and passive that has worked the Signature 50 fund being the best performing over the last 10 years. Similarly, for the 60 fund, I'm not going to comment too much on each fund uh, here, but it follows, uh, you know, um, similar kind of lineup where over the one year, uh, you know, your more active uh, funds have done well. And really, our course may be on the 70 portfolios, as majority of the Sydney and Greater Retirement Fund assets are invested in the 70 portfolios. So members do tend to spend the majority of their working lives invested in the 70 portfolios. We can see that over the one year, Synergy um, at 2.1% is the third best. What has really worked well for some of the portfolios that have outperformed over the one year has been your more alternative type of asset classes for investments in hedge funds, in private equity. Um, those types of asset classes have added to portfolios. And um, over the long term, we can see that, um, you know, Synergy has really delivered. So these asset managers that are in the portfolio have done consistently well and their returns, uh, you know, are coming through across every single time period. And in the signature 70 fund, only one basis point behind Synergy over 10 years. And it is important to focus on the 10 year number. As I mentioned, members are expected to spend the majority of their working lives invested in this portfolio. So we can see that blend between um, active and passive doing very nicely over the 10 years, providing an annualized return of 10.8%. The skeleton fund, not too far behind, not even a 4% uh, behind, bearing in mind that these surveys are grosser fees, so on a net of fee basis, the cheaper portfolios uh, would actually come up higher. So all three ranges actually do very nicely um, against competitors over the long term. It's always interesting to also compare how these, you know, very well diversified, multi-managed type of portfolios stack up against single managers. So we can see that over the one year, value has uh, done well. So value is an investment style, which Adam Gray follows as well as MNG. So they've done really, really well over the one year. And then we can see Synergy and uh, Signature right up there with some of the best uh, single managers. A lot of asset managers have underperformed these portfolios um, across these uh, measurement periods. And again, focusing on the longer term, especially over the 10 years, we can see that both Synergy and Signature have outperformed every other asset manager. Um, in the market, bearing in mind that very often a lot of these single managers are a lot more expensive um, and you can expect more choppy performance uh, from being invested in one um, asset manager. As they tend to follow you know, certain investment styles and the market environment is not always conducive to the investment style that they follow. And then this for me really summarizes um, it, you know, how the portfolios have done but also taking into account how much risk uh, the portfolios have taken on. So it's important to be rewarded for the amount of risk 
uh, that a portfolio takes. So this is a 10 year amount related to scatter plot. We have risk on the horizontal axis. So the further right you look, the more risky a portfolio is. A portfolio becomes more risky when there is a higher allocation to um, you know, equities, to property, to hedge funds, to alternative um, investments. That's when a portfolio becomes more risky. And then the portfolios that are closer to the left hand side have higher allocations to bonds and cash. And then we've got return on the y axis. So ideally, for every level of risk, you would want the top performing portfolio. So if we look at um, the synergy range and the signature range, we can see that they definitely are the highest performing portfolios for the level of risk that they take. Focusing on the signature 70, for example, we can see that. Uh, the risk as measured by standard deviation seems to be sitting at about eight and a half percent. So for this level of risk, it has been the best performing portfolio over the last 10 years. Anybody plotting underneath that portfolio has taken on the same amount of risk, but has simply not been rewarded as high of a return for that risk taken. And then the portfolios to the right have taken on even more risk then signature 70 or synergy 70, but simply have not been rewarded over the long term for that uh, risk taken. So overall, from a performance perspective, as much as it has been tough, especially over the short term, the portfolios really have delivered um, on what they set out to achieve over the long term. So how have we been positioned for the current market environment? So I gave you, you know, a brief summary of some of the key bets that have been um, you know, happening around the globe that we've been paying attention to. But what we are seeing is that fear does continue to drive the market and not fundamentals. So, you know, we're seeing this excessive pessimism. And, uh, you know, if you look at this chart on the right hand side, investors are feeling now the way they were feeling, you know, in the market crash of 2008. So sentiment is extremely low. But there are opportunities, um, you know, inflation is set to subside. And, um, you know, if you think about um, investing for the long term, we still do believe in our themes. We do have some select uh, technology exposure. We are overweight value. And we still remain with our views that, you know, emerging markets, some of these Asian economies will provide. Uh, you know, some good returns to the portfolios over the long term, as well as some of our other things, such as healthcare. So looking at these themes, we do uh, construct the portfolio in a core satellite approach kind of way. The core of the portfolio is more of your traditional asset classes. And you can see our current view of these asset classes where we underweight ESA equities, overweight South African bonds, overweight global equities, and low global bond exposure. And then we add to these traditional asset classes. We add in certain themes. And these themes are themes that we do expect to outperform the general market over the long term. So that we do believe in sustainable economies. And we actually recently launched a sustainable, a sustainable economy fund. And sustainable economies for us is all about this marrying of uh, innovation and sustainability. So a lot of exciting companies in the space, then disruptive technologies, you know, we get very excited about our fourth industrial revolution fund. Uh, where you have exposure to anything from, you know, 3D printing to space exploration uh, to sustainable agriculture. So those are the kind of exposures that you can expect um, in uh, the, from the fourth industrial revolution time. Emerging markets in Asia, as much as it has been volatile, we do have that Chinese exposure as well as exposure to other emerging markets. Health has been a theme that actually has been doing nicely in the portfolio. And, you know, healthcare um, is also very exciting from an innovation perspective. And then, of course, value more of a shorter term satellite. Value really is there to take advantage of the current market environment where we're seeing um, interest rates rising. So in a rising interest rate environment, you tend to see value as an investment style uh, do very nicely. So I've already mentioned that we underweight SSA equities, overweight bonds, but what is really the asset allocation of the portfolio? So we can see that if you look from um, you know, the 40 portfolios right up to the 70 portfolios, what we can clearly see is, of course, the 70s have higher allocation to equities, lower allocation to bonds and cash. And then if you want to see the actual makeup of the portfolios, I have them over the next couple of slides. So looking at the signature range, 
just remember the signature range is the blend between the active and passive. So in the equity space, we do have the passive component that tracks the strix, as well as a number of active managers. But they're really there to add that differentiation to the portfolio and take advantage of opportunities. In terms of active managers, we have split them between two sort of large managers and two more boutique managers. Your large managers are nine to one coronation, and your boutique managers are Lorium um, and um, Vizio. In the bond space, you also have a blend between active and passive. And then on the international side, this is really where you see a lot of your thematic investing taking place. So you see your exposure to emerging markets, you see your China exposure, healthcare exposure, fourth industrial revolution fund. This is really where you see a lot of the exciting thematic exposure. In the skeleton range, the offshore portion um, looks exactly the same. And then on the local portion, there's no allocation to active managers. And then the synergy range is where we have uh, a number of active managers that are ma managing the domestic portion. So it's up to them to be rotating in and out of asset classes. And then on the offshore side, it's basically managed by Signia. So this then brings me to the end of my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. And I hope that uh, my presentation provided you with some insights as to how we positioned and um, uh, you know, an explanation of, of what has been happening in the markets and the reason for some of the returns that we have seen. Eva, thank you for that incredible insight. We do have a few questions for you. Uh, and just an apology to delegates. We are uh, experiencing some sound issues. It could be because of bandwidth issues as a result of load shedding in the different areas. So please bear with us in that regard. Eva, just a couple of things. We had um, a relaxation of exchange controls earlier this year, and we know that the new, the revised version of Regulation 28 uh, kicks in early in January 2023. Will that fundamentally, or has it, and will it fundamentally alter the way we, uh, with the way Signia manages money and allocates assets? A very good question. We have a strategic asset allocation and a tactical asset allocation. The strategic asset allocation is where the portfolios have been designed to be over the long term. And strategically, we are not changing the asset allocation. But on a tactical basis, where there are opportunities, we do welcome that freedom to be able to um, increase that offshore exposure. And we already have taken advantage of that. Having said that, we have to remember that the liabilities of members, you know, members are expected to retire in South Africa, um, you know, spending South African rents. Um, and when you have your liabilities in rents, it is also important uh, to consider the South African asset classes, such as bonds and cash, uh, for those South African liabilities. So for that reason, the bulk uh, will still, you know, remain um, in South Africa. But as we see those global opportunities, and of course, uh, taking advantage of rain weakening, uh, we will be at times, you know, utilizing uh, that um, offshore components, that increase in the offshore component uh, quite substantially. We have seen other asset managers have also not really jumped at the opportunities to increase to the very maximum at the moment, but I think it's also understandable, um, especially with everything else going on around the globe. You know, the US is not a great place necessarily to invest at the moment. Developed market economies are generally facing quite significant headwinds at the moment with the high inflation, um, with you know manufacturing struggling as uh, you know consumption moves from goods to services, so it has been quite tough. Uh, but as those opportunities arise, I do think that ourselves as well as other asset managers will really be taking advantage of that increased offshore exposure. And while we're talking about the years, that segue into, into that discussion. For the first time in 100 years, both the S&P 500 and the 10-year treasuries are negative. Um, and I think 2022 being the worst year of those five uh, scenarios. Um, do you anticipate seeing something similar across uh, the other emerging countries and potentially in South Africa if we're not seeing it already? So maybe not as extreme. Of course, we know that most of the trading does happen, you know, in the, in the U.S. market. The U.S. is, of course, the biggest component of a lot of the indices as well. Um, but, um, you know, these are exactly the reasons why we actually underweight, uh, you know, the U.S. at the moment. Uh, so we don't necessarily see exactly the same thing happening, uh, you know, in South Africa or not as extreme. Fantastic. And just the last 
point, uh, Eva, we know that Reg 28 have an explicit exclusion for crypto assets. And we saw just this week that the FACA released a framework, or National Treasury and the FACA released a framework on crypto. What's your views on that? And, and I know crypto in retirement funding is quite a controversial uh, topic. Uh, let's have your views on that. So my view is that you have to change with the times. So I do think that as much as it may not be the most appropriate asset class, if I can call it an asset class for retirement funds, it has, it is also, I mean, blockchain is in our future. So to have small exposure, I do believe it can be beneficial. So having a little bit of exposure on the offshore side or the local side, depending whether it will be deemed local or global, depending where you buy it, I do think it can be beneficial. We also have seen some cryptocurrencies actually stabilize more. Uh, I mean, there's been periods lately where Bitcoin has swung less than some currencies, uh, which is also quite interesting. So I do think that it's very exciting that we're moving in the right direction, um, that if we can launch a product um, that somehow gives our investors exposure to cryptocurrencies, uh, whether we can include it in retirement fund portfolios, uh, you know, we'll have to see and the percentage, but I do think it's exciting. So my view is mostly positive um, on that front. Eva, fantastic. Thank you very much. No further questions and welcome back. Thank you very much. So I will now hand over to Leanne. Good morning, everybody. And um, again, thank you for having me. I'm just going to share my screen once Eva has taken hers down. There you go. Okay, slides should be coming up now. Right, so what I'm looking at today is a discussion of the two pot system. Um, and what we should know about this, just to start with, is what Treasury is trying to achieve from the two pot system. So this is where we started on the presentation today. And what I'm gonna do is try and build up our knowledge in relation to the two parts or actually the three parts um, system um, as we go through the slides. So we'll start at a high level and then we'll look down at more and more detail. But let's start at this very high level, which is two part, the two part system is part of the whole reform process that we're going through uh, within the industry. Um, so what is National Tre Treasury actually trying to still solve for in relation to the um, whole reform process. So there are three main problems that they're um, still looking to solve. The one is coverage, which is how many people are in the retirement fund system. The other is preservation. So how much of what is currently in retirement funds or contributed to retirement funds stays there until retirement. And then the third one is in relation to costs. So if we apply this uh, directly to the two pot system, Really, what we're looking at here is more preservation than the other two um, design problems. And Treasury has said that in relation to this uh, two-pot system, they are trying to solve for two things, so two problems. One is, as we know, um, our members don't always preserve all their monies in, in the retirement fund until retirement. So when they uh, leave employment and they leave the fund, they often take their money out in cash, and that impacts on how much they can uh, save for retirement. This is one of the overall failings of the South, the South African retirement funding system. I was talking at an international conference recently, and we were discussing South Africa's ranking in relation to retirement systems worldwide. And actually, if um, South Africa solved this problem, um, as well as the problems in relation to um, a savings net, we would rank quite well. You know, for example, our ranking in relation to governance is really good. So this is the one issue. Then on the other hand, we have the other issue that Treasury is trying to solve for, which is uh, members cannot access anything in their retirement fund currently until they leave the fund. Um, and this means that 
members resign to get access to their um, retirement fund benefits, et cetera. They're trying to solve these two problems. And of course, they're conflicting, right? The one problem is we want uh, members to save more for retirement. And the other problem is we want to give them access to some monies while they are still within the fund. So when we look at the two-part system, we need to keep that in mind. Treasury is trying to solve for both of these problems. It doesn't want to give access without having the quid pro quo of ensuring at least some preservation of funds in uh, retirement funds until retirement. So this is very complex legislation. Treasury itself said that it is technically complex. Um, and we've seen that through the consultation process in that there's been a lot of uh, questions around how it works. Um, just from the um, release of the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill, which contained all the two-part uh, proposals, it was very difficult to see exactly how it would work and the detail was quite um, opaque. So um, there has been quite a bit of consultation on it. So there's also been uh, public hearings, et cetera, et cetera. And then you would have seen at the end of September, after consultation um, treasury and hearings, Treasury actually submitted a draft um, document to the Standing Committee on Finance for their consideration around these are the proposals that we received here are our um, our responses to our draft responses to those proposals. So what I'm talking about today includes those draft responses. So this is a is sort of the latest look at the as at the, the two-part system. Now, of course, there is ongoing consultation happening on the two-part system with various um, targeted stakeholders. So um, one of the things that was consulted on quite uh, widely and very vigorously was this issue of, well, when is this all gonna start? So the initial date that was set in the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill was the 1st of March, 2023. Everybody um, went crazy about that for different reasons. Labor said, no, it's not soon enough. Financial institutions um, like retirement funds, administrators and others said, no way, there's no way we can get rules amended, our admin systems um, up to scratch on this and communication out to members, et cetera, et cetera, before 1 March 2023. Treasury actually said that date was optimistic. I'm not sure if that was a euphemism for unrealistic, but um, they have changed the implementation date to the 1st of March 2024, which is good news, I think, because it allows us to be in a position that we can deal with this in a, a, a systematic, efficient way. So if we look at who the two-part system actually applies to, firstly, it applies to all pension and provident funds, including umbrella funds. It applies to all preservation funds, and it also applies to all retirement annuity funds. Okay, that's whether the, those funds are defined contribution or defined benefit, it applies. And what the Act actually says, the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill, is, sorry, that's my load shedding kicking in, um, is that there will be new definitions in the Income Tax Act of savings pot, retirement pot, and vested pot, and that those new definitions have to be included within your fund rules by the 1st of March, 2024. And not only must they be included there, but if they are not, the tax approval of your fund will be at risk. So this is the stick, right? This is saying you will have um, the two-part system in your rules by the 1st of March, 2024. So we can expect uh, still more changes to the two-part system. You know, what I'm presenting today is by no means um, set in stone. There will be more changes to it. Um, and um, so I wouldn't be making any major decisions until we see the final version of this. Um, and the final version will only be promulgated next year um, at the time that the budget is um, is published, which is usually 1st of March. Okay, so 
Um, we also know that the, the um, terminology that they're using may change. For example, the industry said, well, this definition of vested pots, that's very confusing because it can be confused with the 1 March 2021 compulsory annuitization vesting. So that sort of thing might still change as well. And then there's still a lot of work to be done, right? So they're still consulting in relation to defined benefit funds, including the GBF. And um, 37 D deductions, there needs to be changes to other legislation, uh, for example, the Pension Funds Act and the Divorce Act. So there's still actually a lot of work to be done. Before I go through the three parts at a high level um, and then dig deeper into them, um, there are important design choices that have been made by Treasury in relation to these three parts. So the first one is this whole debate about seeding. So if you hear seeding or seeding debate, this is what they're talking about. What they are talking about is how much of your fund value that you've built up before this legislation comes in, i.e. before 1 March 2024, members will be allowed to access. So how much of what you've already built up in the fund before the legislation comes in, will you be allowed to access without leaving employment while you're still a member of the fund once this legislation comes in? So this whole debate is about how much we take of that and put into our savings pot and allow members to access. So um, Treasury has gone backwards and forwards on this. Um, in the previous version, they said no seeding. There was a lot of consultation and submissions on that. And now um, they are uh, probably going to look at some uh, seeding from the what you've already built up into the savings part. But we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So that's the one important design choice. The other design choice by Treasury is um, this idea that you will have a portion of your fund i.e. what is in your retirement pot, that when you leave the fund as a result of a termination of employment, so a withdrawal, um, you will not have access to. Um, so everything in your retirement pot will have to stay there until retirement. So those are two very important design choices that impact on um, the, the two-part system going forward. So let's just look at the three parts. I've got them on the slide here. Um, in um, at a high level, um, and then we will delve deeper into them. So you've got the three parts, your vested part, your savings part, and your retirement part. That's what they're called at the moment. Your vested part holds everything in your fund that you've built up before the 1st of March 2024. So everything that is in your fund as at 1 March 2024, that goes into your vested part. Then your savings part and your retirement part are made up of what goes into the fund and is built up in the fund after the 1st of March, 2024. Okay, so your contributions are split after 1 March, 2024 between the savings part and the retirement part. Your savings part is the bit that you can access while you're still a member of the fund without having to leave employment. And your retirement part is the part that will have to stay in the fund until you retire. Okay, and there are some slight exceptions to that. We're starting to see creep in, but we'll talk about those in a minute. So vested part, everything up to 1 March 2024. Savings part, retirement part made up of contributions after 1 March 2024. Okay, so I've got that on the slide here so that you can see it all in one place. If this red circle is our uh, retirement fund, um, everything before the 1st of March sits in this vested part on the left. Everything um, after, contributed after 1 March 2024 sits in our savings part and our retirement part. Contributions are split between the savings part and the retirement part after the 1st of March 2024. So one third of contributions have to go into your savings part and two thirds of contributions have to go into your retirement part. So I'm using the words have to, must, because that is another design choice that's been made. Um, in the previous version, it was talking about, well, up to one third of your contributions. So you could have some sort of choice. You could choose like 10% or 15% into your savings, but that has been done away with. 
and it is a straight one third that must go into your savings pot. Okay, then um, we'll talk a little bit more about those contributions and how it works over the next few slides. But just to note, we have this exception on the left hand side here in this little brownie colored arrow that we that is contributions into the vested pot. That is just an exception for very specific members. And we'll talk about that um, towards the end of the presentation. Besides from that small exception, all other contributions after 1 March 2024 into the savings pot and retirement pot. Okay, so let's start with the savings pot. So on the left of these slides, um, just so that you can orientate yourself, I've just given you a summary. And that summary will stay through um, the slides. So it starts with the summary of the savings pot, what goes into the savings pot, and what comes out of the savings pot. So that is how I've structured the presentation, what goes into each pot and what comes out of each pot. Right, so firstly, um, let's have a look at what goes into the savings pot. So as we said, one third of contributions after 1 March 2024. That is one third of net contributions. Okay, so it specifically says that charges like admin fees or you know, other expenses and risk premiums, for example, in relation to um, insured fund insured benefits, those all come off for, before and then your contributions are allocated between savings pots and the retirement pot. One third, two thirds. Okay. They don't want any arbitrage of expenses and fees between the pots. So they don't want, for example, all fees coming off the retirement pots and not the savings pot. So it should be that they come off first. Then there might be possible seeding into the savings pot from your vested pot. So from everything you've built up before this legislation comes in, some part of that might be put into this pot um, and you might be allowed access to it. How you are allowed access to it um, may still be decided. So it might be that, you know, if they allow the seeding into the savings pot, that they put rules around how you can access that. And if you're listening to Eva um, and Duane earlier talking about liquidity in relation to uh, the retirement pot, this, sorry, the savings pot, this is important in relation to investments and liquidity, because how you will be allowed to access that part that is seeded from the vested pot into the savings pot is important. You know, it may, it may not be that you're allowed access to it all at once. It might be phased over a number of years or whatever the case may be in order to ensure that the liquidity of retirement funds is, is not um, compromised. Okay, then we have um, transfers in to the savings pot from other savings pots. So you can transfer amounts from one savings pot to another savings pot when you transfer between funds. And then lastly, what will be in the um, savings pot is fund return. Okay, so contributions, one third of your contributions, um, net, um, any seeding that's allowed, transfers in from other savings pots and fund return. That's what is in your savings pot. So let's look at what comes out of your savings pot. So first of all, the whole point of the savings pot is that we allow some money out without the member having to leave employment. So that is the first bit that is allowed to come out, is a member can take what will be called a savings withdrawal from the savings pot every year. Uh, as long as the member's got 2,000 Rand in their savings pot, they can take it out every year. So you can take that much or more, okay, not less. So this is a rolling 12 months. So if the member takes it on 1 June, 2024, they can then take another withdrawal 1 June 2025. Okay, so that means that we have to keep track of these rolling dates. There are no other prerequisites in the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill. So it doesn't say you have to be in financial distress or anything like that. There's no trustee discretion. It is just um, at the member's um, um, direction. Okay. Um, if you take a savings withdrawal from your savings account, your savings pot, um, that will be taxed at 
the members' marginal rates. So it just becomes income um, to them and it is taxed at their marginal rates. Right, so what else can come out of the, the savings pot? When the member actually does terminate employment and leaves the fund, then the member can take on withdrawal whatever is in their savings pot. Even if it's less than 2,000 Rand, the legislation will be amended in that regard. They can still take out whatever is in their savings pot when they actually withdraw um, from, from the fund as a result of termination of employment. On retirement, what do you get from your savings pot? On retirement, you can, you will be able to take your savings pot in cash or as an annuity. Okay, so you're not forced to take it in cash. You can take it in cash, you can take it as an annuity. If you take it as an annuity, probably what will happen is they'll just transfer it to the retirement pot. Um, if you take it on retirement, if you take your savings pot on retirement, then your normal, uh, normal retirement tax, uh, lump sum tax tables that currently apply will apply to your savings pot as well. So that is a design choice and a clever one. If you take your savings pot pre-retirement, you're going to be taxed at your marginal rates. If you take it on retirement, then you're not going to be taxed at your marginal rates. You're going to be taxed in terms of the retirement lump sum tables. So that could fall within your tax-free amount. Okay, so much more favorable tax treatment if you take your savings account on retirement. Right. When else can you take money out your savings pot? Um, like all of the pots, you can take your money out your savings a pot if you are if you've immigrated, so you're non-resident for three years, or you, your work visa expires, then you can take all three pots. Okay, so not just your savings, but all three pots you can take out of um of the fund, subject to that waiting period. Now just to note that there will be a change to the Revenue Laws Amendment Bill draft, um, which says that even these members who have emigrated and are in that three-year waiting period, they will also be allowed access, like everybody else, to their savings pot. So they'll be able to take 2,000 Rand or more a year annually um, from their savings pot. Okay, so that'll be a slight change to, to what was recommended before. Then the other way that money can come out of the savings pot is transfer. Um, so if you are transferring from one fund to another fund, for example, a section 14 transfer, then um, your savings pot is transferred from the savings pot in this fund to the savings pot in the other fund, or you can specify that you want it to go from the savings pot in this fund to the retirement pot in that fund. Okay. In addition, even if you're not transferring between funds, you can always say to the fund, I want to transfer money from my savings pot into my retirement pot. And there's no restriction on that. Okay. There's going to be a lot of comments on this, I'm sure, but currently there's no restriction on that. So you can say at any time this month, I want you to transfer you know, 3,000 Rand from a savings pot into my retirement pot. Next month, they'll come back, oh, can you please transfer 200 Rand from my savings pot into my retirement pot? I think we're going to have to deal with this in the rules just to make it sensible, but at the moment, that's the way it's structured. All right, the retirement pot. So if we look at the retirement pot and what goes um, into the retirement pot, it's two-thirds of net contributions after 1 March 2024 into the retirement pot. Then any transfers in from a, an, another fund's retirement pot into your fund's retirement pot because it's um, a, a transfer in, as an example, or a transfer in from the savings pot to the retirement pot. Remember, we talked about that before, plus fund return. So that's what sits in your retirement pot. What comes out on withdrawal uh, because your employment is terminated, you do not get anything from your retirement pot. Okay, so retirement pot has to stay safe in the fund until retirement, no withdrawals from it. There is an exception that's being discussed to this in relation to retrenchment. So treasury is still cons considering this, it's not a pre-gone conclusion, 
but they're saying because the changement is beyond the control of members that they will consider whether um, if members are retrenched uh, from employment that they can access some of their retirement pot. This will be subject to conditions. For example, you must have um, exhausted your UIF um, and then you must have um, um, must have no other income coming in, so you need what the income from the retirement fund, plus it will be paid out as an as annuity income, not as a lump sum. So, for example, if you do then get reemployed, that will then uh, the payment will then stop. So, there are lots of these conditions that are currently being discussed. Um, then your retirement part, the whole point of it is that it pays out on retirement. So this is called a retirement withdrawal benefit. Okay, don't be confused. This is a payment of your retirement benefit. Um, so what you get from your retirement part on retirement is the whole amount, but it must be paid as an annuity, right? No lump sums allowed from your retirement part. All of it is paid as an annuity. Um, taxed as it currently is, um, in terms of um, if you purchase an annuity, your annuity income is taxed, so tax, no changes in relation to taxation there. Then just respect with respect to small retirement benefits, so you'll remember there is this day minimus or minimum amount of 247500 which if you're, um, you have a small benefit, they apply this day minimus amount to the benefit so that you're not forced to annuitize a very small amount. So this um, de minimis amount will apply to all amounts that have to be annuitized on retirement. So that is the intention. I don't think the wording is there yet, but the intention is whatever you have to annuitize on retirement. So that'll be your retirement part plus a portion of your vested part. Whatever you have to annuitize, the de minimis amount will be applied to that amount. Then um, on transfer, you transfer retirement part to retirement part between funds. You cannot split pots out when you transfer when you're transferring out of the funds to so send some of your pots to one fund and some of your pots to another fund. Doesn't work like that. And then on immigration, same thing. Your retirement part is paid out in, in full when you are paid out your benefits. So let's talk about the vested part now. So. Um, besides from a, a very specific exception, which we'll talk about in a minute, no contributions into this vested part after 1 March 2024. Okay, so what goes into this part is everything you've built up in the fund after 1 March 2024, plus your fund return, plus um, any um, transfers in from other vested parts, as an example. So. Um, if we are looking at the vested part, um, which is a very simple concept, as we see on the right hand side of the slide, it's simply anything that you built up in the fund off, uh, before 1 March 2024, we're looking at that vested part. Um, there are going to be what I see as layers within that vested part. You know, one of my clients said to me the other day, okay, that looks like you're going to have layers. And I think that's a good way to see it. Three parts, but this vested part has got layers in it. And these layers relate to annuitization. Okay, so remember compulsory annuitization came in in 1 March 2021. The whole intention around annuitization is that it carries on as it was before. Right? There's no changes, they're not changing anything. And you'll find a lot of the annuitization in layers in this vested part. And what I mean by that is um, whatever was vested in this in your retirement fund as at 1 March 2024 will continue to be vested in your vested part going forward. Okay. If it was not vested for an annuitization purposes um, in your fund before 1 March 2024, then that is simply reflected as not vested for annuitization, annuitization purposes in your vested part this vested part going forward okay so exactly what was what was happening before in relation to neutralization carries on happening okay so whatever was, was vested or non-vested for neutralization purposes before 1 march 2024 carries on being exactly the same thing vested or non-vested 
for neutralization purposes in your vested pot going forward. Okay, the only exception to this is, do you remember those older members, what I call older members, um, which I will be soon, I'm sure, but so remember those members that were members of a provident fund as at the 1st of March, 2021, they were 55 years or older and they are still contributing to the same provident fund, right? So I'm calling those the older members. So I don't have to say those words um, every time I talk about them. Okay, so for those specific members, let me repeat it. You were 55 or older on the 1st of March, 2021 in a provident fund, you're still in the same fund. Okay, so for those members, their contributions will be paid into the vested pot. Okay, now why? Because for the vested pot, your rules that apply before the 1st of March, 2024 will continue to apply to the vested pot. So you're almost gonna have two sets of rules for the fund after 1st of March, 2024. The rules that applied before then that still apply to the vested pot and then all your new savings pot and retirement pot rules. Okay, So it means that if you have money in your vested pot, all the rules that currently apply continue to apply after the 1st of March 2024. You can still take it out on withdrawal. Um, the same rules apply on retirement. Your annuitization rules still apply in relation to that vested pot. Okay, that's why these older members are going to contribute into that pot, because it means that um, the old rules that applied before the 1st of March 2024 to that fund continue to apply to, to those contributions. So we're not messing with their um, benefits after 1 March 2024 because they're closer to retirement. We want them to just stay the same. Okay, so... Um, this was all muted with, um, with um, Treasury, and Treasury said the intention is that those older members, their ongoing contributions into the vested pot will also be um, uh, vested from an annuitization point of view, so it's no change. They would have been vested from an annuitization point of view before this legislation. They'll still be vested from an annuitization point of view after this legislation. Okay, they'll be sitting in the vested pot. Um, then people said, well, that's not really fair, is it? Because what that means is that those older members don't have a savings pot. So they don't get access to anything while they're still members of the fund. So they are looking at that now to decide, are we going to give these older members, specific older members, um, access to some sort of savings pot? And it seems to be that the thinking is, for these older members, you'll either say, no, I want to keep everything the same, in which case you won't have access to a savings pot, or you say, no, I'm happy to go to the new regime, I want access to a savings pot, in which case they can't have their cake and eat it, and they're going to lose this ongoing um, annuitization of their ongoing contributions. So they'll have to sort of opt into the system or not. Okay, so that sounds very complex to me, and I think that, that there'll be a lot of consultation and discussion around that. Okay, so I'm nearly finished, Dwayne, um, just to show two summary slides. So this is a summary of transfers between pots when you're transferring from one fund to another. Retirement pot to retirement pot, savings pot to savings pot, vested pot to vested pot. The only exception to that is you can transfer from your savings pot in this fund to the retirement pot in another fund. Then this is a summary slide of payments out of the different pots. So I've sort of put them together and said what happens from the different pots on retirement, a withdrawal without terminating employment, withdrawal with termination of employment, immigration or visa expiring, and transfers between funds. Okay, so I won't go through the slide unless a particular delegate asked me to or Duane would like me to, um, but I have put it all together for you um, on one slide here so that you, um, you know, can put it together in your mind. Um, so Duane, that's all from me. Thank you very much. Yeah, and thank you. Incredible insight and yeah, quite a bit of complex legislation which has evolved over the last couple of years. 
we do have quite a few interesting questions in there, so I'm going to pose them to you from our delegates. Stian Pretorius asks, um, and it's largely around the seeding question, since there would be potential seeding um, and given the transfer principles, would we is, is the legislation taking into account the transfer of retirement annuities into occupational schemes? We know that you can currently on exit tran or and retirement transfer from occupational schemes into retirement, but can, given this complete harmonization in a sense across all forms or all elements of the retirement funding system, once this new legislation comes in, do we anticipate that retirement annuities can be transferred into occupational schemes? Yeah, so just like we saw with compulsory annuitization, where we saw pension and provident funds converging and there being no real difference between them, I think that we're seeing the same thing in relation to retirement annuity funds and occupational funds, so pension and provident funds. So I certainly think that as they converge and the differences become you know, less and less, that we are going to see, well, you know, why do we need uh, to have all these different types of funds. Of course, the only remaining difference between a retirement annuity fund on the one hand and pension and provident funds on the other is that there is this link to the employer, right? So in a retirement annuity fund, there is no employer and you can, you know, you don't need uh, an employer to make a contribution into a retirement annuity fund. So I think to the extent that you are transferring a retirement annuity fund into an occupational fund and you have an employer that can make those contributions that could be viable but to the extent that you know a, a, a person is not in formal employment as an example or has their own business or whatever it is then retirement annuity funds will retain their usefulness um in the in this new regime going forward but i certainly don't i don't think that treasury will make that change up front with this two-part system, I think it'll be something that'll come later. I think they are very focused on simply dealing with two-part at the moment because it's a lot just in itself. Got it, Leanne, thanks. Um, Zoe is, is concerned about, Zoe Wilson Davies has asked us about the investment strategy. Has there been any clarity about the, the look and feel of the investment strategy for the savings parts? You mentioned that liquidity is obviously a concern because people will need to draw down on a rolling 12 month basis. Um, so is there any sort of uh, indication as to what that would look like, whether members have more say over the investment strategy on the savings part uh, versus just using the fund default investment strategy? Yeah. Oh, hi, Zoe. Firstly, it's nice to talk to you again. Um, just um, on the um, default investment portfolio issues. So this issue of the investment portfolios that sit behind these pots is, of course, very um, topical and there's lots of discussion going on about it. Um, and when we had this proposal that you could decide how much went into your savings pot and in your retirement pot, I think that at that stage, that discussion was um, perhaps um, more technical or complex. Now we've got a situation where a specific amount, one third, has to go into your savings pot, two thirds has to go into your retirement pot. And that makes the portfolios that sit behind those pots um, a lot more important to discuss. And why I say that is, if you're a person that is, well, I want to keep everything in my fund until retirement, I'm going to be very concerned with how that savings pot is being invested, right? I want to know that it's not sitting all in cash and bonds and liquid investments, right? Because I know, well, I'm not going to access it. I want to keep it there until retirement. Having said that, most funds and, and um investment consultants that I've spoken to, and um, uh, Eva might want to comment on this, is have said to me, we're not going to have different portfolios for the different parts, right? We're going to have one set of portfolios still, um, and you won't be able to say, well, my savings pot will be invested here and my retirement pot will be invested there. However, the fund will have to look at liquidity across the fund in relation to um, you know, the fact that more money might be coming out of the fund. Um, I'm not sure if Eva has a, has a comment on that, perhaps. Thanks, Leanne. I think you're spot on the way we understand it. And if you look at the way that uh, the portfolios are constructed at the moment, they are constructed in a 
in a you know the asset allocation is you know majority in liquid assets as at the moment we do we are able to pay claims as they come through so we don't expect you know the strategies to be very different to, from what you're seeing um, okay. in terms of asset allocation the kind of managers and the strategies that we're using at the moment okay perfect perhaps just to mention Dwayne as well as that um that's part of the consultation was that the treasury was asked well does reg is regulation 28 going to be applied to each pot number one question i think the answer to that treasury said that's not our business ask the abca <laughs> my answer to that would be regulation 28 applies across the assets of the fund okay it's not a pot issue um the other question that they were asked is um, is, is the FSCA going to prescribe some type of, sorry, is, the, is Treasury going to prescribe some sort of um, asset um, allocation or portfolio type, et cetera, in relation to this two-part system? And Treasury said, absolutely not, it's not their business. And if the FSCA wanted to do that, then, you know, they can. I don't think the FSCA would touch that with the barge pole. I don't think they'd want to be prescribing how a fund should be invested because that creates liability for them. So I don't think that the FSCA would look at either of those two issues. Okay, so a bit of a wait and see game and uh, let's see what the legislation tells us. Uh, the last question from, from Stian Pretorius is about tax arbitrage. So we know that the, the contributions or deductions um, or contributions to a retirement fund are subject to tax deductibility. Um, and the contributions that are being paid out of the savings pot will then be subject to some form of, of tax. Can we just delve a bit into the different forms of taxation around tax deductibility on sort of the contributions that are going to the various pots versus the tax that we are expected to pay from the various pots? Yeah, sure. So I'm not sure I understand Stian's question perfectly. So if I don't answer it, Stian, you're welcome to send it through to Dwayne and, and we can talk about it um, outside of this. But just generally speaking, the tax deductibility in relation to contributions is not going to change. Okay, so that stays exactly as it is now. Um, with respect to the savings part, it's just the manner that that is taxed when it is withdrawn that changes. So your um, your uh, tax regime is not changing completely from that point of view. The, the deductions on tax, sorry, the, the tax deductions on contributions, same. The, the um, fund return, exactly the same. It, the, the change is only in relation to any pre-retirement withdrawal from your savings pot. They've simply changed the way that is taxed. And that is at marginal rates, instead of your normal uh, tax tables that apply on withdrawal. Otherwise, everything else is the same. Yeah, thanks. Maybe if you could just explain that last point one more time for our delegates as well. So it's it's about avoiding tax arbitrage. Yeah? So we know that the higher earners get the same tax deductibility as the low earners. But if they withdraw from the savings pot at the current oh, tax tables, they would benefit uh, more than the low earners. They don't, because, because their income is higher, they're taxed at a higher uh, at a higher rate because their marginal tax rate is higher. So of uh, course, yeah. the higher your income, um, the more tax you pay on a withdrawal. If I can put it that way. So I don't think there is tax arbitrage there. Brilliant, Leanne. Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's all the questions that we have. Uh, if any more come through, I will let you know towards the end of the session. And uh, thank you very much. Thank you so much, Stephen. We'd like to hand over to you. Thanks, Dwayne. I'll um, just take over the screen. And I hope that you can all see that. Um, right. Uh, so two things that I've been asked to talk to uh, today by Dwayne. Um, the uh, first uh, is about authorization. Um, and the second is about the perhaps some of the intended consequences of the authorization regime, uh, which have come about in the shape of consolidation. Um, I was in South Africa in August and, and, and spoke to Dwayne on this subject, um, and it was quite remarkable to me that how similar the systems between the uh, South African market and, and the UK market was when we compare master trusted umbrella funds. Um, I think the conversation that Dwayne and I went down was that there are you know, so many similarities that 
uh, with the South African authorities seeming to be following the same route as the uh, painters regulator in the UK. Um, it might be nice for me to give some of uh, the insights from the learnings that we have uh, from our process through authorization. Um, uh, so that's context of today's presentation. Um, and I'm not here to teach you how to suck eggs, as we would say in the UK, and, and, and that's, the, that's in a sense not, not telling you how to do it, but, but more sort of sharing our experience and saying if the intention is to follow the UK model, um, there are some things that you need to be aware of and there are some preparations that you might need to be, to be making. Um, it was not a, an easy process. Um, so without further ado, I'll move on to the subject of authorization. Um, it's useful to have a bit of the background when talking about authorization. Uh, we, we, we needed authorization for a number of different reasons. Um, firstly, uh, we had a piece of legislation back in 2012, which was called auto enrollment, and that was designed to cover some of the issues that Leanne has been speaking about first is uh, coverage um, uh, and, and making sure that um, going from a record low level of participation in pension schemes, we came up to a level which was almost universal, but not quite universal. Um, and again, it was it was interesting listening to, to Leanne and about some of the unrealistic expectations of our regulators and our, and our, and our uh, legislators. Um, the original intention of auto enrollment was to auto enroll all people into a pension scheme on one date in October 2012. And that would have meant the industry having to deal with something like 30 million employees being auto enrolled into a pension scheme. Um, and after some uh, lobbying by the industry, we managed to get that spread over five years. And even that was quite difficult and quite fraught at times. Um, so uh, I, I'm pleased to see that the legislators seem to take the same approach to uh, industry concerns uh, all over the globe. Um, what what auto enrollment did was um, it made it a, a compulsory for all employers to offer a pension scheme. Um, and uh, for the larger employers, this also meant taking their own pension schemes very seriously, uh, which largely they, they, they hadn't necessarily done particularly well up until 2012. Um, this meant that the existing regime of DC provision in particular had to evolve. Um, and whilst we've had master trusts um, probably since the beginning of pension time, going back to the, you know, the Elizabeth I and the, and the, and the poor lots, um, there was an explosion of master trusts between 2011 and 2016 as auto enrollment became a, a, a real thing. And what master trusts did was effectively it took the um, pain away from employers uh, and, and, um, and from groups of trustees. Uh, and offered a, a way of providing auto enrollment that uh, it outsourced all services, outsourced not only the investment services, the administration services, the record keeping services, the communication services, but it also outsourced the governance services as well. Um, before auto enrollment, there were probably a handful of master trust, commercial master trusts. Uh, by the time we got through to the uh, end of the auto enrollment period, um, which was around uh, 2017, there were over 100. Um, and some of them were well run, uh, and some of them were not. Um, some of them were run with good intentions, and others were not. Um, and you can draw your own conclusions through that, and my words as to, to, to the real reasons behind their existence. And because the market had evolved faster than legislation, um, the master trusts were uh, regulated in exactly the same way as any other occupational pension scheme. So if you were an employer running your own DC scheme for your own employees, you would have been subject to the same regulation as master trusts who were growing bigger um, and were uh, becoming more important in the market. And arguably the failure could have led to a more dramatic um, outcome for members um, uh, with the failure of master trusts over the failure of a, of a pension scheme. So the regulator had to do something about that. It identified that master trusts would be the way of provision of the future um, and clearly wanted to take away any possibility um, that there could be failure and therefore a reduction in trust in the market. And the UK market has been hit by pensions um, trust issues time and time again over the last um, 20 years. 
Uh, so another, another episode of failure in that system would not have done trust in that system, a system that already suffered from a lack of trust and a lack of belief and a lack of engagement. Um, it wouldn't have done it any good at all. So the, the one thing that was left for the regulator to do was to intervene um, and to start to uh, regulate master trusts in a way that was different to the regulation of other pension schemes. So that's the background. The Even process itself. For interrupting, is there any way we can get you to get closer to the mic? Uh, ah. We do have some. <laughs> the, the, only way I can get, the only way I can get closer to the mic, Dwayne, is by making the uh, my face bigger on the screen as the uh, <laughs> <laughs> as I get closer to the camera. And whilst that may sort the sound, it won't do much on the eyes, but uh, we'll give it a go. Is that better? Uh, I think we can live with that, Stephen. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, so uh, the uh, the process itself of authorization was one where um, the regulator uh, put in place a two stage process. Uh, the first stage was really a trial run, a test to see whether um, master trust could achieve the bar that they were setting uh, for um, for authorized status. Um, in effect, what we had to do was authorization process, uh, submit all of our documentation to the regulator as if it was the real thing, and then to receive feedback from the regulator on the basis of the content that we'd, um, uh, we'd submitted. Um, so you know, it, it, it was not a not a simple exercise. It was it was not a you know it, it was a time consuming exercise. Um, but I think from the regulator's point of view, it did allow them to say, this is the bar we expect you to achieve. And from a master trust perspective, it gave us an insight into the expectations of the regulator. Um, it was an open process. Uh, it was a two-way process. And I applaud our own regulator for, for taking the time to run it in the way that it did. Uh, it allowed the regulator to learn and it allowed us to learn. The area of focus um, broadly fell into five areas. Um, there were systems and controls, uh, scheme financial details, the fit and proper regimes, um, the continuity strategies and the business plans that we had to submit. Now, when you look at those five titles, um, they all seem fairly self-explanatory and you would imagine easy to achieve. Um, the, uh, the, the real answer is that actually the, the depth of knowledge and the depth of information that we had to submit on the back of those, uh, for those five headings were, was actually quite, um, quite there, there was a heap of paperwork that needed to be, um, to be completed. Systems and controls, um, particularly trying to convince a regulator uh, that your administration processes, your privacy processes, your security processes were sound, um, was complex. Uh, the scheme financial details, uh, ensuring the regulator understood that your financial backing was uh, extensive, um, that it was secure, uh, and that it was accessible, uh, again, was a strain for many master trusts. The fit and proper requirements, um, the fit and proper requirements for the trustees, the strategists and the directors of the firms that were backing the master trust were extensive, more extensive than if you were becoming the director of a company and more extensive than if you were um, being regulated directly by the FCA, the Financial Conduct Authority. Um, the uh, pensions regulator went a step further and needed more in-depth information and more in-depth scrutiny of your own uh, financial pasts and presence. Um, for a firm that has many of its directors based in the US, this caused a particular issue for us. We weren't alone in that. Uh, other companies like Fidelity and, and other US firms suffered from the same. Um, uh, but again, our regulator listened and was accommodating. Continuity strategies and business plans were two things that were interlinked. Um, the business plan was not necessarily about where is your business going to come from, but it was the Bible that sort of set out to the regulator exactly what your master trust was about, how it was run, who was operating it, what were the long-term plans. And the continuity strategy was making sure that if those plans were not fulfilled, 
um, what you would do to protect the members' interests um, in the event that you had to fold because your founder or funder decided to withdraw from the process. So we went through this twice. Um, and uh, on the second attempt, the, the actual real uh, submission, um, it, it, we, we submitted over 1,200 pages of documentation. Some of it was repeated, um, but it, it ran to, 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 to thousands of, of pages, and all of those pages were, were scrutinized by, by the regulator. Um, and I would say uh, on the next slide, but I'll say here, please do not underestimate that if your regulator goes down the same route as ours, um, that the amount of work that is required is incredible. The amount of detail that is required is incredible. Um, and the amount, even for a well-funded, well-resourced business, uh, the amount of effort that is required um, was uh, underestimated by many. Um, and even once we've been granted the, uh, the authorized status, uh, the requirement for continued compliance uh, didn't mean that the pressure was off in terms of the way that we were uh, expected to run our business. Um, we may have achieved the bar that the regulator has set, and we were, uh, we, we were quite fortunate that we were granted the lowest level of ongoing supervision. Um, there are three levels in the UK. We have a basic level, which we, 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 we see. Um, there is a moderate level of uh, authorization, and then there is virtually an, an intervention method. Um, uh, we're lucky enough to, to have been granted the lowest level, uh, but in some ways that, that makes our lives a little bit more difficult because in, in reality, we have to contact the regulator rather than the regulator having um, uh, regular contact with us. Uh, and, and I believe that actually good relations with the regulator um, actually make life much easier. Um, however, I would not want to be in the position of some of those organizations that have the heaviest levels of regulation, which is virtually intervention. You're, you're, you're close on, not quite being run by the regulator, but you're certainly, you, you, the scrutiny that's applied to you is, is, is uh, it, it, yeah, it, 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 there's a great deal of um, knowledge that the regulator wants of what you're doing. Um, the annual supervisory returns that we now have to make uh, require us to pretty much update every document that we submitted to the regulator as part of the authorization process. So that means updating business plans, that means updating continuity strategies. Uh, every three years, we have to review the fit and proper requirements and resubmit documentation um, to support the continued presence of individuals working within the business. Um, and as I've said, yeah, please do not underestimate the amount of effort that this takes, uh, even for well-organized and well-governed and well-funded businesses that have the support of their parents. Um, if I compare the staffing levels that I have now to that that I had pre-authorization, I have now got three full-time individuals that work solely um, on our submissions to the regulator uh, each year. So that's a significant effort that we've had to make, a significant investment that we've had to make in the infrastructure and people to be able to um, maintain our position as an authorized master trust. And without that position as an authorized master trust, we wouldn't be able to be uh, accumulating new clients. We certainly wouldn't be allowed to continue operating in the way we are with existing clients. And we'd have to trigger our continuity strategy um, if we lost our authorized status. Um, so it's, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a burden we have to bear. Now, the burden we have to bear has also got to be borne in mind with the other legislation um, that we see at the same time. Um, we've had to deal with the uh, TCFD, um, which is the Task Force for Climate um, and Financial Disclosures. Uh, this is a pretty extensive piece of legislation that is looking at climate uh, as an issue for trustees. And, and, and effectively asking them to um, put financial metrics against uh, how the climate impact of the fund um, is being determined. Uh, we've had the need to provide chairman statements um, each year. Uh, in the DC environment, we've had to do this for, for a number of years now, but they have the, the requirements um, increase each year. 
Um, and now our colleagues in the DB environment in the UK are having to do a, a very similar, similar thing. Uh, these documents have become longer and longer. They were originally intended to be of use to members. Um, they're now pretty much inaccessible to almost anybody except a practitioner, um, given the depth of information, the depth of uh, knowledge that has to be imparted uh, in them. And we also have to provide value for money. Um, value for money has been a, a concept that's been around in DC and the UK for, for, for many years, but now we have to demonstrate that we provide value for money. Um, and that is to say that we have to prove to the membership through the chairman's statement um, that their uh, membership uh, of a pension, of a section of a master trust, is providing them value for money. And, and value for money extends much further than simply the costs and charges that are deducted from accounts, um, but takes into account those, non, you know, those, those less tangible aspects of communications, uh, tools, um, and, and, and other services. Um, not least of all the retirement services. Um, so lots of things that go into value for money with, with little or, or, or no um, sort of fixed rules in, in how we demonstrate value for money. So you get lots of dispersion of um, examples of value for money across the, across the market. So uh, you've seen the background, um, you've seen the uh, effort that's required to actually comply with authorization um, and then the continuous compliance that's required uh, after you achieve authorization. Um, and you know, we, not forgetting that there's always other legislation that has to be dealt with at the same time. Um, this had uh, some, I would say, intended consequences. Um, and, and those consequences were intended by the regulator. Um, I said right at the very beginning. Uh, that the regulator had a task to make sure that the system had a degree of trust, um, that those people that were not necessarily running master trust for the right reasons were removed from the market. And that market, uh, uh, that has meant consolidation. And the regulator made no secret of the fact that it wanted consolidation down to maybe a dozen or so master trusts within 10 years of, of, of authorization itself. And I think, personally, um, it, it, it's well on the way to achieving that objective. Again, I'll give some background and some context to uh, how consolidation is happening. Um, if we go back to 2010 and um, before authorization, you probably had about 200,000 people that were saving um, through master trusts. Um, and according to the last numbers reported by uh, the pensions regulator, you've got over 20 million members now saving through master trusts. Um, before authorization and before the need to prove value for money, uh, you had the vast majority of members in pension schemes accumulating uh, balances through something group, group personal pensions or their own employer's occupational pension scheme, a standalone trust, as we refer to them in the UK. Now, there were tens of thousands of these. Um, I, I was looking at the numbers just yesterday and looking back at some of the data that came out of the regulator's 2010 survey. Um, and it was suggesting that there was about 55,000 occupational schemes and um, probably an equivalent number of GPPs that is harder to quantify. Uh, the statistic for the number of GPPs that, that were in existence, uh, but probably an equivalent number. And very, uh, you know, a great deal of these were very, very small um, arrangements. Uh, it was estimated that about 45,000 of those occupational schemes had less than 12 members. So it starts to be, you know, the, the question then it, it has to be like, how do these small schemes prove value for money? Um, and what is it that the regulator could, could do about them? Um, what's happened is uh, that the number of pension schemes, occupational pension schemes, and the number of master trusts has reduced, uh, both through the process of legislation, auto-enrollment. Few people wanted to auto-enroll through their own um, DC arrangement and, and chose to use master trusts and through market competition itself. And in the master trust market today, we've seen um, that sort of pre-authorization circa over 100, around 90 as the regulator counted them, 
uh, reduced to um, 37 providers that actually achieved the authorised status. Um, and our, through our own assessment, we believe that there are about 30 that what we, as we would consider them, open for business. Uh, because some of those master trusts, whilst they still have an authorised status, um, they have in fact been consumed by others. Uh, SEI itself has consumed another master trust um, at, at the end of last year when we bought the Atlas Master Trust, um, which was owned by our third party administrator, one of our, one of our partners. Uh, that master trust still has authorised status until such time as it's properly merged in with the SEI trust. Um, which should be before the end of this year. Um, standalone trusts uh, below those with below one hundred million pounds in assets are now required to question their own future, and they're required to question their own future at least annually, and they need to consider whether they should be moving to a master trust to provide their members with value for money. Um, and this is a big move by the regulator because, as I've demonstrated in the previous slide, um, there could be thousands of these small pension schemes around that are being used for auto enrolment or used for accumulation of member benefits, um, which are too small to provide the same kind of value as master trusts provide. But equally, uh, having said that we've consumed another master trust in the last 12 months, there is an awful big move at the moment for further consolidation within the master trust market. The master trusts broadly fall into three categories um, uh, if they are some of those 30 that we believe are active. Uh, they are either open and growing, as the SEI master trust is, they're considering a sale, um, and we're already in conversations with others who are considering selling themselves because they can't see a future in the market. Um, or worse still, they don't know where their future lies. Um, and I say worse still, and that's probably the worst position for an employer um, or um, a member of those master trusts, uh, because they don't know whether their master trust um, is going to be supported by its financial backer. Um, or whether uh, as an employer, you're going to put your members, your employees through further pensions change in the future. Uh, I think much of the consolidation that we're seeing going on at an employer level at the moment, um, the biggest question that's being asked of providers is whether um, there is certainty of continuation of the provision of benefits over time. And I think that's a good question to, to be asking. Where do I see this landing up? Um, I probably see that in the next 10 years, um, we'll probably be down to less than 10 master trust providers and probably a handful of the very largest standalone occupational trusts run by some of the biggest companies, biggest employers in the UK. I think it needs to be uh, at a level where there is sufficient choice. I think if you get to a point where you've only got two or three providers, um, then you just get different shades of you know, shades of mediocrity with no potential for um, competition, for innovation. Uh, but if you've got at least a dozen um, competing schemes working in the same market, uh, you can actually drive some pretty good innovation because you can, or, or everybody can achieve scale um, and everybody can uh, you know, invest in developing a proposition that is going to have member outcomes at its heart um, and improving member services. And you would hope over time um, would improve trust um, and you would hope over time uh, would improve engagement and, and a sense of ownership, um, which our system certainly doesn't have at the moment. Um, but I think Leanne demonstrated that, that yours probably can have, uh, particularly when you're linking those savings pots and retirement pots. So in summary, I would simply say, uh, if your regulator does choose to go the same way as ours, um, there's a lot of work to look forward to. Um, please don't underestimate the effort that it is required to gain authorised status and do not take lightly um, the activities in getting there. But I think there is good reward from the other side. Um, I think uh, from what I understand of the South African market, uh, you have a very long tail of very small schemes um, that don't necessarily provide value for money for uh, the membership. Um, and like in the UK, you should see that reduce 
um, and you should see overall better outcomes for those people whose outcomes we should be uh, working harder to achieve. And I'll just pause there, Dwayne. Stephen, thank you. A, a truly fascinating sort of insight into the UK legislation. Uh, and I think it's quite clear um, the paper released by our National Treasury in December 2021 very clearly indicated uh, the implementation of similar legislation that you've gone through, the authorization criteria. You, you talked about the tail um, that we have in South Africa and you, you're spot on. There are more than 470 type A umbrella funds, commercial umbrella funds or uh, master trust as you would call it in, in the UK. And the total value of assets under management is close to about 610 billion. 90% um, of those assets and the membership sits with probably the top 10 yeah. um, and a higher proportion in the top four, top five of the funds in the country. So we do expect radical consolidation um, just on the standalone master trust that you talked about. Did you see quite a bit of consolidation into master trust there? Because in South Africa, we around 15 years ago had about 15,000 active standalone retirement funds or standalone master trust as you call it. And we're now down to about a thousand. Yeah, we've seen uh, a huge contraction in that market. As I said, there was about you know, 55,000 um, standalone trusts. Um, we have uh, an, an awful lot fewer than that now. Uh, and and I, I believe that you know, as we go through this year and next and, and, and beyond, there's those schemes that have less than 100 million in assets. Um, I, I think there's only one place they will go and, and they will consolidate into master trust because that's where the value for money and the, and the development is, is, is happening. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the question that I have out there is once the regulator has dealt with those trusts that are less than 100 million, and, and that could in, in effect be some of the very smallest master trusts, where will it go then? Um, does the threshold then raise to 250 million, to half a billion, to a billion? Uh, and then you get to the point where you start to see even some of the more successful commercial master trusts, they start to be um, dragged into this need to assess value for money. And, and then you're looking at something that is similar to the Australian system where all of the super funds have to assess themselves periodically to make sure that they're still able to provide value for money. And, and I guess whilst the South Africans may look to the UK regulators, the UK regulators also look outside of our boundaries and look to other territories where consolidation may have gone further, may have gone harder, and Australia is one of those environments. Stephen, you, you mentioned there were three sort of um, options that Master Trust were faced with uh, upon authori authorization. And, and one of those was having a look at themselves and, and assessing their own futures. What, what does that mean as in actually taking the view that they're no longer viable um, and therefore need to make some form of decision to consolidate with another retirement fund or master trust or, or to stop doing business? Uh, both of the answers, uh, and we've seen both um, of those types of activities. There was um, a uh, one master trust at the point of authorization who could, I think, have achieved the bar, but they actually decided to withdraw from the process and close themselves to, to new business. Uh, since authorization, um, there's become somewhat of a, uh, a cottage industry um, of uh, your sort of activity between master trusts and trying to buy for who buys who. Um, I, I'm one of the biggest, um, I, I, think, you know, I think it's sort of publicly acknowledged in the UK that we have participated in the biggest acquisition so far um, in that we bought a master trust that was three times larger than we were at the time. Um, but that master trust was had, you know, had to go through quite a, a sort of internal soul searching to say, if we remain open, are we just going to be pumping more money in to keep the, keep the authorised status without growing the business? And if that is the case, is that a viable position for a, you know, a FTSE 100 company as they were at the time? Um, and could they do something better with the capital? And the answer was yes, they could do something better with the capital. They decided to sell the business, we bought it. Um, but there are other organisations that are having that same soul searching going on at the moment. Yeah. Stephen, when we chatted a few months ago, we talked about the similarities between sort of the UK market and the South African market. 
Um, you or SCI is a multi-manager and you're backing a master trust, but your market is very similar to ours in that it's dominated by insurer-sponsored uh, master trusts. How, uh, what are the difficulties that you found operating in that market uh, that we can perhaps learn from? Yeah, it's, um, it, it's a fascinating one because my background, other than being in the consulting environment, has become it's been either insurance companies um, you know, in the early part of my career or some of the biggest asset managers in the world in, in, in the latter part of my, my career. Uh, and actually trying to break down the, uh, the, the barriers um, and sort of you know, almost by force of will change some of the entrenched behaviours in, in the UK is, is actually pretty difficult. Um, uh, and what you need to do, or what we've found, is, is have a very clear idea of what your vision is. Have a very clear ability to be able to articulate what your goals are uh, and have a very clear ability to be able to distinguish yourself from the competition um, and be able to say, you know, at SEI, we, we state that we are the leading investment-led master trust. Um, and, and if you say that, loud enough and often enough um yeah well, whilst we believe it other people start to hear it as, as well um eva showed some charts that talked about the risk and return um, um you know, the, the 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 conundrum between taking enough risk and, uh, and and achieving the right return for that we've got similar charts that we showed that show that we we are the leading master trust because we understand um, those investment conundrums better than any of our insurance-based or, or consultant-based competitors. And the charts that we show, show ourselves in a very similar position as being sort of towards the right-hand side, but certainly towards the top of those charts. So we can start to demonstrate that that's the case as well. And, and in reality, what we do is we set challenges to those people that have been in the market for an awful long time and say, can you do this too? What is your... USP. What is it that you're selling to your membership? What is it that you're providing to your membership that is different? Or are you just another shade of the same grey as your competitor, um, where the only thing you've got to offer is a brand name, and a brand name doesn't produce better outcomes? So those are, yeah, we, we, we'd love to think that we're a bit of um, uh, it's a, a, a business that's trying to break a mould. Um, and, and trying to stop some people sleepwalking into making easy decisions and, and, and trying to, to, to give them, um, you know, it's almost challenging the intermediaries to, to, to take a chance to understand there is something different that is available, that that something different has the potential to give a better outcome to members. Um, and it's not the same set of providers that have been around for the last 30 years and it doesn't need to be either Stephen, if you can ask you for a better way to conclude the session so thank you very much for for your remarks and for a fantastic presentation um and to our other pre presenters this morning eva and, and leanne um we don't have any other further questions so i'd like to thank everybody for joining us this morning for the valuable contributions from our delegates as well as from our panelists um, and we look forward to seeing you at the next quarterly webinar which will probably be in january and just one last remark guys it's 60 days left till christmas and with that thought goodbye and have a good day further bye Dwayne. bye everyone